Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show where I talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Arrow, as well as the latest episode of Legion. Like always, if I'm talking about something you don't want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include the time when I start talking about each of the respective shows. So, for example, if you don't want to hear what I have to say about this week's episode of Arrow, you can skip to what I have to say about this week's episode of Legion. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is Arrow. So this is a, actually a pretty intense episode of Arrow. It's kind of, it kind of is a very, I guess you could, um, it, obviously there was a, a huge message behind it, and that's kind of gun control. Essentially, uh, a guy attacks the, you know, Oliver's office, uh, City Hall, essentially, and quite a few people that were there, kind of people in his staff and stuff like that, were killed. And... Obviously, the big part of the episode is, like I said, that big debate of, like, gun control. It's like, because, I mean, it's kind of a, like I said, very loaded question. And it's, this particular guy, his name is James, the one who committed all these crimes. It wasn't like he, in particular, targeted Oliver. And the reason for that is, be, it's not like he had a, a, a clear target in mind. He just wanted to get a lot of attention. Because it turns out this guy, his wife and child died because they were killed in a uh, mall shooting and so now this is kind of his way of getting retribution because basically there was going to be not necessarily a bill the word they use is ordinance that was basically going to be put in a place to kind of act as more you know a registry was going to be brought up to be like hey people have to register about their whole their gun situation and their names on the list and stuff like that but some people in particular a councilwoman as well as other people decided to kind of shut that down uh, just because it brings up the thought of like, oh, it will invade people's privacy. It just gives the government more options to kind of spy on you because it's like the right to bear arms is, you know, your right. So it's just like it's just more government interference in something that doesn't need government interference because you're essentially your gun situation is your own. It's not the government's, you know, business enough. And like I say, it leaves a lot of people conflicted on many different fronts. Because I, to me personally, how I sit on it, is, you know, it's reflecting the show and it's obviously just how I feel about it in general. And like, I agree with Oliver. Like, he said it, it's complicated. And it's like, oh, you, you're like, oh, it's complicated. Like, you know, should you, even the reporter's like, oh, can you really say that to their, you know, to the, all the, the family members of the people that died, can you really just give them an answer? He's like, no, I can't. I'll give them a proper answer, but I'm not giving you one. It's like, obviously, like, being mayor isn't easy, but this is kind of one of those moments where it's like he's unprepared because obviously he has his mentality of what, because like I, I like I agree with that. It's 100%. It's a complicated situation because it's like, yes, guns are used for violence and everything, but at the same time, they're also used to save lives. That's kind of where, you know, it's kind of a debate, you know, it's, re it's represented on many different levels, obviously with the situation going on, but it also came up in kind of a debate situation between Curtis and between Renee, because it's like Renee's all for guns because it's like guns means protecting people. I mean, because if it wasn't for the fact that he had a gun, he might not, there might have been more people that got hurt when James attacked C.D. Hall because, you know, Renee had a gun on him and everything, which granted, he's not supposed to have that on him because he's a civilian and, you know, he's he was dishonorably discharged from the military, which we still don't 100% know about that. But we did get a little peek into Renee's past in this episode, but I'll kind of go into that in a little bit. But the main thing was, like, Curtis is like, oh, the fact is that, you know, obviously the, the statistics and everything, and Renee's kind of bringing up the fact is the bad guys have guns, so I should be, you know, locked and loaded, too, because it's the only one. You have to fight fire with fire. When the bad guys have a lot of arsenal guns and arsenals on their side, it's like you have to kind of fight back on it. It's the only way you could even a playing field. You know, and like kind of going back to Oliver, why it's complicated for him, because it's like, yeah, situations like this happen. It's because, you know, there's not, you know, control when it comes to guns. But at the same time, he he understands the need to protect those you care about, too, because, I mean, he knows better than anyone, like what it means to protect someone that you care about. He's lost a lot of people, you know, here in Star City, obviously previously Starling City, but it's like. He's also a lot of people, so he knows more so than anyone what it means to, like, fight, you know, want to protect the people you love. And he does that every day. But even he kind of feels a situation where it's like, maybe they feed into it a little bit, the cycle of violence. Because the, basically, James is only doing this because of retaliation, because of what happened to his wife and daughter. It's mainly because, like, because it, it even comes up later on the episode. The guy that got the gun, it's not like he went through legal means to get it. He went through illegal means to do it. But even James knew that. But it didn't matter because to him, all he need, all he, because at the end of the day, he was hurting. 
all he was mad. All he wanted was someone else to suffer too. Sadly, he didn't think about the fact is that he's dragging innocent people into this. Like, yes, your wife and daughter were innocent people, and that should not have happened, but it did. But that doesn't justify him going off and doing the same thing because it's like you see the way you feel about your family. It's like it's literally the same way those family members of, of those people he killed feel. You know, it's like you know an endless cycle. It's like. Someone created him, like, you know, someone killed his the people he cared about, which puts him in a situation where he kills other people that someone else might care about, and it's just an endless cycle of violence. And it's a situation where Oliver is like, we kind of have to find a middle ground, a way to not step on everyone's rights, you know, to bear arms. It's like a, a way to protect those who decide to own guns and, know, you know, obviously keep things in a, a legal manner for them to own guns, not trying to make it extremely hard to own guns and stuff like that because it's like, because if the whole situation, because it's like an ecosystem because it's like, if it makes it, if it's harder to own guns, like gun shops will kind of get a decrease, you know, and you know, sh stores and stuff like, you know, help, you know, a city thrive because the money they make can be going towards the city. So it's like when businesses do poorly, it reflects upon the city, like the city will start doing poorly all over. So like I said, it's kind of its own ecosystem. So it's like you have to find that medium. And it's like, you know, like I said, correlating this, like obviously this episode has a big message behind, which I appreciate it because it's like you still tell a good story while also getting a message across. And it's like, you know, you kind of show development of your characters like this was a big episode for a lot of people, in particular Oliver, because it's like he it kind of forced him to kind of step up his mirror because also this is a situation he couldn't solve. It's just Green Arrow. It's like, yeah, the Green Arrow can stop bad guys. Sure. But it's a problem that exists outside of just James. James isn't all there is to this situation. He is a small part of something much bigger. And that's just the whole gun situation. So. It kind of forced him to kind of step up, you know, and realizing that yeah, things aren't easy, you know, being mayor. And that's the point. They shouldn't be easy. Like the choices that matter the most, which isn't the same choices that are easy don't matter. But it's like the choices that really matter the most that can make the most difference are the choices that are hard. Like I said, in this situation, it's a hard decision to make. Like I said, you can look at both sides. You see the pros and the cons. You understand things, obviously. Everyone's got their own opinions. Like I said, I'm in the middle, and I'm sure a lot of people won't appreciate that. They're like, oh, how can you be on the middle on something like that? It's, it's just the way I feel, and that's just my opinion. Because it's a situation of, like, politics. Because obviously, Oliver's never really been the political person, but now it's kind of a situation where he kind of had to step in that... Um, step in that direction in this episode and that's kind of because more so than anything just not just developing as a person but developing as a mayor just of a leader because even Thea's like are you sure you want to jump into this because gun control was a very very heavily political thing and it's like it'll kind of you know go against them but you know Quentin's like no the fact is this is all about protecting people and doing what's right for everyone so it's like Oliver needs to kind of step up and do this so but I'm um, kind of going back to it. There was a situation where we had like, because Felicity, every time the conversation would come up, she kind of shut it down. She'd be like, okay, I know you. Because mainly it's because she's like, oh, she hears like both Curtis and Renee going back and forth, kind of being like, oh, she doesn't want to be a part of that. Because to her, she feels like, oh, the arguing and stuff doesn't do anything. It won't result in anything. All you're doing is tearing each other apart and just kind of going back and forth. But, you know, which is somewhat like, like the moment I saw that, I was like, okay, like Felicity is supposed to represent what? Not everyone, but there is a group of people, not necessarily that someone's 100% in the middle, because really it's kind of four groups. There's the ones that are pro-guns, some who are against guns, there's the people in the middle who just see both sides, and there's also people who just kind of, who are also in the middle, but they more so than anything, they just don't want to be a part of that conversation, because it's just, because it's so complicated, because she knows, you know, because it's a situation where... A lot of times it leads people to kind of tearing at each other's throat. With Curtis, it's like, no, like, we shouldn't be afraid to talk about these things. Like, debate isn't a bad thing. It's like, because obviously through debate, we learn about each other's opinions, and we get to see things from a different perspective. It's like, you know, we kind of expand our own knowledge by welcoming in another perspective, which isn't always the case. Not everyone is like that. It's just kind of... I don't know where they could argue. You could probably argue it's a societal thing. Maybe it's a human nature thing. But never, whichever way you want to look at it, it's just you know that it doesn't always work like that. But that's what makes debating so good. He's like, even though me and Renee are going at it, it doesn't change the fact is that it's a good thing that we're talking about. It be it just shows you how important the subject is. The fact is we shouldn't be quiet. Debate is something you know it has always been throughout history. Obviously, we just kind of look at it as kind of something rude almost. You know. 
debating and disagreeing with someone is like almost like it's a bad thing to disagree with someone. It's not a bad thing because everyone has their own personal beliefs. So obviously, you take you know, Curtis, the example of like he not being really big into gun violence and, you know, so he believes heavily in gun control. But in Renee, when you look at his situation, which is like a whew, uh, very messed up situation that make you understand why he is the way he is, because to him, he's like, yo, guns. If I had a gun in that particular situation, my wife, his wife, Laura, would still be alive. We found out that basically his wife, Laura. I mean, in fact, is he's married and he has a little girl named Zoe. Essentially, his wife, Laura, was kind of still caught up in drugs um apparently they had left the glades but that was kind of something she had adopted in the glades and he thought maybe then moving away would make things better but it didn't she was still on drugs basically the guy who was her dealer came to the house basically renee was trying to get to his gun in the safe but basically zoe came out of room a struggle happened between laura and the guy and basically renee ended up shooting him but the guy's gun went off and it ended up shooting Laura. So it's a situation where like Renee feels like if he was able to get to his gun quicker, it, the circumstance would be different. And then the whole situation ended with him losing his daughter too. Obviously he's never brought it up before because it's like, obviously it's a very touchy subject, which is kind of even more so why I want to learn more about why he got dishonorably discharged. I'm, I was thinking maybe that might be something that would have came up, but it wasn't. And that's another thing too. Like, this isn't the only episode that's ever done it. The same thing happened in the crossover event where it's like, this isn't the first episode of Arrow where we didn't actually get a flashback, which we did, but it wasn't connected to Oliver. This one in particular was to focus on Renee, or kind of understanding why he is where he is now. And then you have the whole situation with Curtis who is trying to help. He said like, oh, I got a good lawyer friend that's going to help you get your uh, little girl back because it's like you are a fit parent because it's like, you know, because it's like, it's like, oh, basically the circumstances around this whole situation, like, you know, foster care was probably like, probably social services is more particular is what I'm, I'm trying to say, uh, was probably more inclined to be like, oh, you, you live in a very dangerous environment that's not right for your daughter. It's like, he was just a man trying to protect his daughter. But at the same time, it's probably like the fact is he had that gun illegally being a civilian and everything. This is after him being dishonorably discharged. So that probably played a heavy point in it. It's like, even if he was protecting himself, it was still a situation where he killed a guy and especially he did in front of his daughter. And then his daughter also saw his mom, her mom dead. So... Like I said, it's just, it's just like really sad. Like now you kind of understand why, kind of why he is the way he is, the way he kind of, because obviously Renee's not big on talking about himself at all. Uh, he kind of just lets everyone else do the talking. He just kind of stays behind. Like obviously he kind of talks big and everything, but I don't know. Now we kind of understand a little bit more. And cause we saw it at the end of the episode, well, at the end of his flashback of like, you know, seeing Oliver, you know, the Green Arrow killing Damien Dark, why it inspired him, because he saw someone standing up and doing something, trying to do good. And not only that, but he also saw the entire city rally behind him. It's like, I guess, like, you know, Renee looked at him and was like, okay, here's a situation. I can join, I can be like this guy, help make Star City a better place so that what happened with my family won't happen to someone else's family, you know? And I'm sure in some way he felt like this is his way of honoring his wife, Laura, but at the same time, also doing good you know trying to make a, a a place better for zoe so also you know maybe make the city better so that she can i mean granted i don't know if she's still in star city or not um but nevertheless you know make star city a place that she can come back home to and that you know he could be a father that she could be proud of essentially so I mean, this episode, like, I brought it up about Oliver just being the only one growing from this episode. I, like, I said, everyone kind of is growing. But in more particular, like, it also led to Renee growing because he's got a new position. He's actually Quentin's, like, assistant now, which Thea wasn't super happy about because she's like, wait, okay, I'm never leaving again because, like, when I leave, things around her change. In more particular, the whole Susan situation between her and Oliver, so. Because something else kind of popped up in this episode, too, that, um... It was just a little piece of the episode. Like, it's still the whole branching situation with Felicity, how she's using the flash drive. Obviously, she lied to Oliver and saying, like, oh, she's been trying for the past three months. She's basically been doing stuff to kind of search for Prometheus's mom because she's kind of going undercover since everything happened. They're like, oh, maybe it's she's staying so well hidden because she knows who her 
husband, I mean, who her son has become because they still don't know his name and everything, but also maybe it has something to, I, I'm thinking maybe it's because maybe she had something to do with her husband's business and she was kind of worried that she might kind of be dragged into this too. I mean, granted, the vigilante is quote unquote dead because, you know, everyone thought that uh, Roy, you know, thinks Roy is a vigilante slash the hood. So it's kind of like, okay. I mean, obviously that changed last episode because we know that Susan now knows that they're like all connected to Hood, Green Arrow, and Oliver Queen. But that's his own thing that I'm sure is going to be coming up pretty soon. But she's still using that flash drive, but she's still lying to everyone about it, even though she her like because she you know because she thinks it's the right thing to do, and it's kind of a kind of a similar circumstance with this whole gun control situation. Because like I said, it's a lot of power to give to one person. And it's like yes, she's trying. It's, it's like, yes, she has a very powerful weapon in her hands, but the fact of the matter is if you're careless, it can lead to a lot of people getting hurt or just like things could easily blow up in her face without her even realizing it. So it's a situation kind of like how the go gun control situation is like, yes, people should be allowed to kind of do their own thing. You know, they have the right to bear arms, but there should be some limitations put in place to make everything a little bit easier. Like I said, it's not an easy solution to, that it came down to. It had to be Oliver and Renee kind of, you know, because Renee being a bit advocate for guns, you know, it took him and Oliver sitting down to really kind of chalk up a plan to be like, okay, this is what we think would be a benefit. It's going to be a situation that everyone can kind of get behind. And even the councilwoman was like, okay, I'll go with all of this. But she's like, basically, this is her cashing in a chip that eventually she's going to want payment for this situation. Essentially, like, political help. So, basically, Oliver's probably going to have to back her on something going forward in the future. But getting back to my point, in fact, is this is a very dangerous tool. Even um, Rory Ragman brought it up last episode of, like, oh, you need to be more careful with these this type of thing because it's too much power for one person to have. So, it's like... It's like putting, I, I don't know, like I'm not going to go in and as deep as I was about to, I'm just going to drop it there, but it's just, it's like I'm super afraid for Felicity because she just doesn't realize the ramifications of what she's doing. Maybe, I don't know, I, I feel like, and you know, obviously it's to the point that even Felicity, because the fact is, if it was 100% on the up and up, Felicity would be more open about it, but the fact of the matter is that she's not kind of says a lot. But like I said, at the same time, it's like, I feel like Felicity's kind of battling who she was as a hacktivist and who she is now, you know, and she's like, both times she was trying to do the right thing. I mean, she went about it different ways. And now it's, you know, especially last episode, episode kind of brought up the fact this, that she's willing to do anything for the sake of, you know, trying to get the job done, you know, that, but that turned into the whole conversation that Oliver is like, yo, we got to be better than this, you know what I mean? But Diggle was like, oh, they make each other better. So I don't know. I hope this. I hope it doesn't blow up in her face, but I just get the feeling that it will. And there was also another storyline about Dinah that basically she hasn't, like, she's kind of been living in a place that the team has set her up in, Tipperary. Also, I'm surprised that Quentin didn't say anything about her name being Dinah. I guess it's just because it's like, we already had so much to focus on this episode. They didn't want to tackle on that, too, because they're like, I'm surprised he didn't have some reaction. Like, oh, it looks like you're adding more people to the team. It's like, oh, yeah. And Diggle said Dinah. I was like, is he about to say something? Like, Quentin just kind of overlooked it. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Like I said, I, I, it's probably a situation where they didn't just kind of want to overload it. Obviously, there's already little storylines here and there. We even had the return of Vigilante, but it was for, like, only one moment. Um... Still totally think it's Adrian. Because he he did have a look at the end of the episode where, like, you know, because obviously, obviously out of anyone, he's kind of big into guns and everything just because it's like for him doing things because he goes about things different than Oliver. Oliver's not willing to 100% put every bad guy down. I know I'm crossing streams here a little bit, but it's a very it's a big reflection of the whole Daredevil situation versus Punisher in season two. Granted, it's very different because... Daredevil never really killed anyone. It's like Oliver's killed a lot of people. So him and Vigilante are very much alike. But Oliver's trying to go down a different path to find a different way. But Pun Vigilante, I was literally about to make that slip. But that's what I get about talking about similar things. But even in that case, it's kind of a circumstance of like, you know, Vigilante's thinking his way is the right way. Because it's like Oliver's weight, you know, Green Arrow's weight isn't enough. So I'm surprised they didn't cross perhaps more often throughout the episode but luckily nothing else came up because Oliver was able to get to James and was able to kind of talk to him as Oliver Queen not as a green arrow so but get, getting back to what I was about to bring up 
was the whole Dinah situation. Like, she's living in a, you know, the place they set up in and everything. But it's like, because she's not willing to really, there's a place she had in mind that she wanted to get could be a perfect place to be. But it's like, she can't bring herself to live there because it's like, do, you know, before living there, she has to answer all these questions. Like, oh, what's her occupation? What she was doing before? What she's been for like these past three years? Because there's no real, because she was off the grid being, you know, going all vigilante and everything. So it's like. There's no record for what she was doing for the past three years. And it's like she would have to answer that before she gets a new place. It's true. When it comes down to it, she's scared because it's like, it's like, how do I go back to being like, you know, buying, getting a home and everything? That's something normal. And it's like, she's abnormal. Not just being a metahuman, just after everything that's happened to her. It's like, you can't just come back and fit into a normal life again. Which is like, you know, it's like no one here in this group has a normal life. Everyone tries their best because it's what it comes down to is taking those steps forward. That's kind of what Diggle gets, tries to get across to her. It's like the fact is you have to take those steps forward, you know, when like initially when Diggle got out of the military, like he didn't really know what he wanted, where he was supposed to go, like how his life is supposed to fit and everything. But it's like you take one small step at a time, take these little steps here and there, kind of just make do something with your life here and there. Like, you know, for her taking this first step, it's like, hey, even getting that simple place, a place kind of to call your own, is just one step to kind of normalizing your life a little bit. Yes, your life is a little weird, a little hectic, obviously, being a metahuman after experiencing everything that you have been and now working with a team of heroes, you know, being a hero yourself too. You know, life won't necessarily be normal, but, you know, it's a circumstance of like, Got to find that balance, which is something, like I said, everyone is struggling to find, trying to find their place, trying to find out how they kind of readjust everything. It's literally what Oliver's been doing for the past five years, trying to readjust since coming back from Lee and you. And that's still a, a path that he's slowly working his way down. Obviously, there's been a lot of dips, you know, but there have also been high moments as well. So it's just it's constant roller coaster that you kind of have to figure out as you go. I mean, at least that's how I see it. Like I said. A very good episode. Obviously, it had a, a message behind it. I don't know at the end of the day. A lot of people may not appreciate it. They're like, oh, maybe I don't want my superhero shows getting very literal and everything. I'm not literal because it's stupid me. Political. But at the same time, it's kind of like out of any show, I feel like this show would have to be the one to do it. Because it plays a part in the show anyway because the show is very political in the fact. But we've never, cause we've never really seen too much of you know Oliver playing the more political angle. And like I said, this is about him growing as a mirror. But not just like I said, not just him. Everyone else, too, just difference of opinions that affect it. And that's a thing that that's a big message kind of getting across. And it's something I feel like a lot of, you know, a lot of people can take something from this show, this episode. Like I said, that, they, you know, one big thing is like just because you have a difference of opinion doesn't mean you have to hate each other. That is such a bad thing to debate. It's like I said, you can always gain another perspective, even though you may not 100 percent agree. It's always interesting to learn from someone else's experiences and see how they view things and why they view things a certain way that they do. And see, it may if that may or may not influence your own way of seeing things. Maybe that added perspective will kind of give you a little more perspective on your own perspective. I know that was just a lot in itself, but I'm, I'm just going to stop. It's just like I said, it was a very good episode. Very interested to see where we go next week's episode. And now moving on to this week's episode of Legion. Obviously, things in this are not as heavy as things were in this week's episode of Arrow. But uh, a very good episode. It, it, there's so many things I want to... Obviously, first of all, Legion continues to be... I think the proper word would be trippy. I brought it up last week's episode, and I just kind of wanted to kind of reiterate it in this one. that, And I hope it's something we do continue throughout the rest of the season. Is that the fact that the show is, you know, like I said, trippy in a sense of like we can't really. It, it does a good job of being like it's hard to say what's what. What's like inside of David's head and what's real life. You know, it's it, they blend it so well. Like it almost to the level of inception. Like you can't tell the difference between a dream and reality. I mean, especially in this episode because... Um, one of the mutants we got introduced last episode, we got to learn a little bit more about him. His name is Potome. He basically, uh, they call him, basically Madeline describes him as a memory artist. Essentially, he can get inside of your head and kind of take you on a journey through your memories. Almost like, it, I would describe it as almost like an interactive movie that you can interact with your memories and stuff. You can go anywhere in your memories and interact with them. Obviously, you interact with them, you change them a little bit. So the point is to kind of not change his memories at all because the whole point is like Madeline wants to get inside of his head figure out 
you know, learn because this whole thing process is about learning a little bit more about his powers, understanding what he can do, what triggers it. So it's like them taking all these different trips down his memory. Um, I've obviously we got a little like it, like I said, it's that weird situation. Where I was like, I can't tell whether this is like him remembering something in the past or is this kind of like his mind kind of like splitting or, or not was basically when he left out of that doctor's office and he went to like and outside was Lenny waiting for him with a stove. I was like, OK, it turns out obviously that was a memory. But like I said, the blending and the transitioning makes it hard to really tell what's what. I really appreciate the fact is that that whole scene was like they basic she basically traded that stove for drugs so they can both go off and get high. And that was kind of another thing, too. It's like it's. It is the past and everything, but it's learning a little bit more. I thought Lenny was just his friend from being locked up, but it's like, no, him and Lenny were friends beforehand, and apparently they got high and hung out a lot of times, too. Um, so that, that, so to me, that also adds more weight to her death, because that's why it bothers him a little more. Because I was thinking, oh, Lenny was just his friend on the inside. Obviously, I was like, he's probably been in a facility for a while, and that's where they bonded, but it's like, they were friends long before they were in that place together. So... Like I said, so it adds even more weight to what happened because even Sydney was kind of apologizing because she was like in that moment she was inside of his head and everything when they switched bodies. And the fact is that she's like, I'm sorry, I'm the one that killed Lenny. And he's like, oh, you know, it's not it's your it's my fault. You should never hand, you know, a bazooka to an amateur. Basically quoting what uh, Lenny said last episode and Sydney was like, what? He's like, never mind. Um. Because, you know, he probably feels more responsible because even, you know, even with what with what Lenny was saying, it's true. Even though Sidney was in his body, that was still him doing that was still his powers. If they had never switched bodies, you know, because it's just because she was in his head, in his body and it was just overwhelming because obviously he's had years to kind of deal with. Obviously, it's not always been the easiest thing because his powers have always kind of leaked out anyway. But in Sidney's case, it's like she wasn't used to it at all. It's like literally everything that's happened to him all throughout his life that he kind of got accustomed to kind of holding back a little bit. It's like, you know, someone who just entered his body and is just having it all rush at him at once. It's a little more understandable. Obviously, at first, we have Madeline describing his powers as being, like, telekinetic, you know. Uh, obviously, being able to read people's minds and move things with his minds. But obviously, we see, there, like I said, this episode was also about discovering what his powers are. And it seems like, uh, slowly but surely finding out, there is a lot more to it. For example, like, he did it again. Like, when in that facility, when Sid basically got rid of all the... Well, more so than anything, when she sent Lenny through the wall and ended up killing her that way, it seems like... David was able to kind of recreate that to a certain extent because the MRI machine or whatever day he was in ended up teleporting away. So it seems like he has some kind of teleportation ability. Like I said, I brought it up last episode. I already know he's literally one of the most powerful mutants in existence. But the fact is, even like I know nothing about his powers, exactly what he's capable of. I've heard he's can probably pretty much do anything, but like exactly how his powers work, I'm not sure. I brought it up last episode, and I really hope that turns out to be the truth, but maybe it's not. Like, maybe it was something I wanted to bring up. I'm not sure if I actually brought it up, but even even if I did, I'll reiterate it here that basically, maybe like eventually, David will have to create personalities to represent all the different powers he has because it's too much for his one brain to like comprehend and control so basically maybe he'll add it after adopt different personalities to kind of do it because that's what i thought was happening in that whole situation where he was looking back on him and lenny getting high and stuff like that the whole stove situation i thought that's what that was like the way he was dressing the way he was kind of acting then i was like oh is that kind of supposed to be like his darker side is more like you know if i had to put it in musical sense like oh here's more punk and rebellious side i thought that's what that was because that's like very different from the david that we see before so maybe spending a lot of time in that facility which i totally forget its name now uh that's why i kept referring to it as just a facility just now but um maybe spending all that time there being medicated you know trying to appear normal trying not to you know trying to get out of there as soon as possible maybe that influenced why he acts differently but that's why i was thinking like oh is that a different side of his personality maybe that's another way he's going to represent his powers like i said trippy show but obviously, it seems like his powers is being like his. He has a form of telekinesis that uh, goes a step further because it's not a, just about reading people's minds. It also seems like he. It kind of reminds me of Cerebro a little bit, like how when Doctor Xavier taps into it, he's able to find people. It seems like Legion. God, I'm literally calling him by his name. I think literally that's how David's power works too. That he can do that without the whole. Cerebro situation. I think that's something. 
I could be wrong, but I think that is something Professor X can do. But it's a more of a situation that Cerebro helps him control it better, makes it easier for him to concentrate and focus on something. So maybe maybe this will be a situation connected to that, you know, because it was obviously there was a situation where he was looking into Amy, like basically her Amy's voice calling him. And then he goes to her like there's obviously we see that kind of phantom image of him. And then it's like Amy's asking, oh, where's my brother at? And it's like, oh, we've never had any records of him. And she's like, what the hell is that about? And he's calling out to her and everything. So it's like he actually went to where she was because she was calling out to him. Obviously not outright being like, oh, David, David, David. Obviously, like from the inside, she was screaming out and he telekinetic. Tele, uh, well, yeah, telekinetic, telekinetically connected or tele, on a, some telepathic wavelength he caught on to that. So obviously his powers has a very large range too because i mean i didn't even go over the fact that they're in a place called summerland which is very interesting like once again i'll reiterate in case you didn't know i don't know much about the marvel universe i know stuff here and there that i've picked up over the years from cartoons as well as movies that i've picked up in especially when it comes to x-men i i know a few x-men here and there i don't know the full cast obviously i know the x-men that most people know wolverine gene gray cyclops gambit so and so and even amongst them i don't even know everything there is to know about them i know the very gist about who they're who, a little bit about their past and a little bit about their powers that's about it so i'm in the same situation except that probably i'll probably argue i know less about david's you know legion than i do anyone else you know amongst the mutants that i am familiar with well, nevertheless, what I also appreciate was that moment in his brain when he was talking to that uh, doctor. I guess the doctor's name is Bolt, which I think is kind of interesting. You know, if you know if anything about the other shows I covered, you know why I thought that was kind of interesting. But nevertheless, um, it's like there was that moment where you almost see a jump cut. I was like, wait, what the hell was that? And even that was not just some like, like, obviously, I felt like it was intentional and stuff like that. I was like, huh, was that supposed to be a fast forward in time or something? I was like, what What was that? You just see that little, like, it almost looked like it was definitely a jump cut. I was like, what the hell is that? And then even Potomi and Madeline, um, Melanie were pointing out, you see that? And she's like, yeah, it's like there was a moment cut out of that because David, whether he's trying to do it on purpose, like, I don't think he's. There's a part of him that's scared that anything connected to whatever that thing is, because to him, he still wants to deny it's like, oh, it's not real. It's not real. But Melanie's like, everything you've seen is real. You're not schizophrenic. You know, it's your powers tapping into something. And he's yet to really kind of tell them about it because Sid knows it's a thing because that's why he was looking at her when she started describing the thing, like whatever it was that she was seeing back at the facility. Like I said, like. I will continue to refer to it as the devil with yellow eyes. I mean, because any that's the best way to describe it because it is a yellow eye. Whatever the hell that thing is. Why is his brain connected to that? I have no idea. Hopefully, we'll find out soon enough exactly what it is. Maybe it's not something else. Maybe it's actually a part of him. And maybe it's a part of him that he's scared of. Maybe that's the deepest part of himself. That that thing itself represents that side of his powers, the darker side of his powers, like that, you know, the side of his powers that he's afraid of. And it's something that he's going to have to confront that basically his powers have a physical manifestation like that. Once again, just completely throwing it out there, probably super wrong about it because it probably is something else. It's probably like another mutant that's trying to tap into him. What it wants, I mean, it's hard to say because all we see is it approaching him, but whatever it is, it terrifies him because it's kind of a moment when we, we, he was having his his dad was reading him a book i was called the boy the angriest boy in the world or something like that and it was like a very disturbing book to the point that like david was like to the point like he was trying to remember what his father's face was looked like he's like oh yeah can i see what he looks like and it's like oh yeah just put yourself in that position and look up at him but it's like hearing the book and everything it terrified him and he just kind of backed away so it's kind of a situation where it's like it's hard to say whether David is doing it intentionally or whether it's his, you know, whether it's his subconscious trying to block something very traumatic. Because anytime it's connected, because even the moment when it dealt with his girlfriend, like the moment before they broke up and everything, like he was in that kitchen and his powers activated. He blocked it. But in a blink of an and that in one moment, Potomi was able to see. He's like, did you see that? It was like a flash. But but David wasn't really willing to dive deeper because I think, I mean, obviously we see like, the book falls off the shelf and you have little boy David as well as grown David kind of covering his eyes the moment you see it. So like, what is that all about? Is that something, is could that 
monster thing be a manifestation of his dad because i mean he didn't make it seem like oh his dad was bad or anything like that he just he seemed like oh man there's my dad oh there's my mom just kind of looking very lovingly and then just seeing like oh things are not as they appear to be that things aren't 100 percent good so, so i don't know I mean, obviously, that seems like that's going to be the direction it takes. Because, I mean, obviously, this was mainly, like, a trip down memory lane, essentially, is how I was thinking of it when I was watching the episode. Obviously, we're going to be continuing it forward because, like, you know, obviously, David wanted to leave in the moment he saw the whole Amy situation. He was like, hey, my sister's in danger. But then, you know, Sid's the one that can convince him. It's like, stay and learn to control what your powers are. You know, learn what you can do. Because basically saying, like, him going out there isn't going to do any, anybody any good. Which at the same time, I'm like, it's kind of a sad situation because it's like my mind is very pessimistic. I'm like, Sid's just being there because obviously, you know, Potomi already brought it up. The fact is, Melanie's taking a very good interest in him because it's just what he is, what he can do. The fact is that she thinks he's the key to what exactly, I don't know, it's a key to everything, the key to saving them, dealing with this whole um, group known as Division 3. They're the group that's in, like, the government group that's in particular is after him. It seems like she's almost being used. I'm sure there's been situations where Melanie's convincing her to kind of play things up a little bit. Obviously, her feelings for him aren't a lie. But there's a part of me that's like, you don't know how far this can go back. You don't know what Sid necessarily went through, what kind of conversations went down before David was kind of brought into the picture of this whole situation. Who's to say she wasn't planted there first to get to know David to kind of earn his trust and his love and then... Like I said, that's a super pessimist inside of me being like, you know, being, oh, love is fake, you know. Like, I don't really believe that, but it's like from a storytelling point of view, that could be where it goes. I mean, it'd be interesting if it, that's where it goes. I don't really believe that. I'm, like I said, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. I, I point that as a theory, but I'm very optimistic when it comes to love. So there is a part of me that's like, nah, it's legitimate. But it's like maybe from the beginning it was legitimate, but then maybe like it got twisted later on because now Melanie wants her to be there to kind of keep him in check. I mean, who's, I mean, I'm sure also the other, I mean, obviously that's just me playing devil's advocate because the other way of it could be like, no, she's legitimately concerned for him because it's like after what she did inside of his body, she wants him to stay there because she doesn't want his powers to go out of control and literally what happened to Lenny to happen to anyone else. I mean, especially because he's in a position where he won't be able to defend himself because it's not like he can truly tap into his powers and control them. So it's not like he'd do anything. He wouldn't be able to do any good for his sister going out there kind of half cocked, essentially. But luckily, you know, he, David changed his mind and decided to stay behind. Another thing that happened was obviously like going back to that particular doctor um, where we ended up seeing was seeing him sit in a chair and his face is bloody and there's all these DVDs that were being taken. So, well, what well, appear to be DVDs. Obviously, they're not DVDs. They're uh, session recordings. So it's like obviously Division tracked down his doctor and beat the crap on him until they took all his stuff. It's like, but then like, what's up with this whole facility situation where it's like, oh, David was never here. Obviously, we see them repairing a little bit. Not unless that had to do with, like, maybe that wasn't necessarily David being in that facility. Maybe at that point, I don't know. I'm Like I said, it's so hard to say what's real and what's fake in this whole circumstance of, like, because I was starting to think, like, well, does that mean that the facility wasn't... Because there, was, because there was something, I don't remember if I brought this up last episode, but something kept running through my mind. I was like, could the facility have all been inside of his head or something like that? All the people he met, even Lenny and stuff like that. But it's like, no, obviously that's not the case. I mean, maybe it is. It's just like, I'm excited. I'm excited because I am so confused. Because confusion just means more stuff that I'm going to learn as the series goes on. And that's what I love about stuff like this. Because it's a very interesting premise. And it's a very, like I said, once again, I will use the word trippy show. And I appreciate it about it Because it's a show that kind of keeps you going like, wait, what? What the fuck? Legitimately moments where I'm just like, what? I, that's kind of my feeling for the show. And I feel like, I mean, a hundred people might not agree. But I think that makes a good show when a show kind of makes you go, wait, what? So, I don't know. And I think so far, this show has done a very good job. I'm very interested to find out more. Like, to find out what this show is all about. What I mean, obviously, it's about David. But, like, what its structure is going to be like. You know, because I was bringing up last episode. Like, oh, is it going to be a situation where he's like, oh, obviously, I know the place name now. is Summerland. But, like, maybe part of the time is at Summerland. Part of it is back home with his sister. Or, you know, what's, the, what's Division telling him his sister, because they're interviewing her, essentially, one of the guys that was there last episode, he's talking to her. It's like, oh, let's get started. It's like, 
Well, I mean, I, don't, I won't think they'll do anything to hurt Amy because the whole point is, I, you know, Sid says it herself. It's like, yo, all it is, your sister's bait. They're not going to hurt her because that's not good. Hurting her won't get them any closer to you. It's like she doesn't know where you are, but you knowing that, knowing that she's captured and everything, or at least the division's got their eye on her, will make him more likely to act. So there's also that particular person, Carrie. I'm very interested in that whole situation because Carrie was like there. He he was the one originally doing the whole situation with like the whole um, MRI machine. But at the same time, there was this other the lady that was there. Like you know, he's like, oh, he's talking. He said he hears a lady's voice. Was it you? And she's working on the dummy. She's like, no. And he's like, he's like, who are you talking to? It's like, oh, I'm talking to Carrie. Uh, you're talking to yourself because he brought that up before. He's like, I'm not talking to Carrie. I'm talking. I'm not talking to myself. I'm talking to Carrie. He's like. But I thought you said your name is Carrie. It's like, yes, it is. So you're talking to other you, the other Carrie that isn't you? And he's like, right. So is it a situ like, how does that work? Is it kind of like a split personality type of situation where it's like at one moment he's the female Carrie and is able to project herself as that Carrie, but at the other same time able to, or is it like a situation where like they split into different people? Like, that at one point they're combined together, so it seems like he's talking to himself or kind of hearing voices in his head very similar to David, and they, they split off and become different people. Like, the best example I can give, maybe, I could be 100% wrong, maybe it's kind of similar to Rudy uh, from the show Misfits. If you're unfamiliar, I know I'm going well over here, but this is the best way I can explain it. Rudy kind of have a personality disorder situation, so when he split, he split up into two people. Spoilers, there's a point where like a third one pops up. But essentially, there's the all the good sides of Rudy and then all the kind of crappy parts, quote-unquote crappy parts of him. Like he's, His personality split like that. So maybe it's a similar circumstance like that to an extent. Obviously, the point is we kind of get to learn a little bit more going forward, not just about their abilities, but everyone... Not just about David's ability, but everyone else's. Because, like I said, a big part of this was learning about Potomi's ability. Um, like I said, very interesting ability. It was kind of interesting when the fact is that there was a moment where David actually blocked Potomi. It's like, yeah, Potomi was like, I can't get us out of here. He's literally too strong. Like, he's too strong for me to kind of put us somewhere. Because it was kind of like diving into David's memories. But because of the whole, like trying to block something out, he ended up pushing them to a particular memory. And he couldn't pull them out, so... It's like a guy that's probably had a while to practice and learn how to control his powers. Like, for example, like I said, he is a memory artist. But even him having trouble against David, who's, you know, not even even in 100% control of his powers. I mean, just because he's not in control doesn't take away just how powerful he is. So, Overall, like a, a very good episode. I'm definitely curious to find out that whole situation with his uh, girlfriend, if that turns out to be something. It seems like that's just a small part I mean, who knows, maybe that, I mean, it's hard to say what's a small thing that will be just very nothing going for, or whether something's going to be a small now, but it ends up turning out to be something much bigger later on, like, so we would just have to wait and see. But really, that's all I wanted to talk about in this episode. Till the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day, and goodbye.